This is a recording of a webinar that was presented by Dr. Bethany Bray on February 26, 2019. It consists of a one-hour presentation followed by a one-hour question and answer session. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Aaron. Hello, everybody. I'm really happy you could join us today. As Aaron said, I'm Bethany Bray. I'm the Associate Director here at the Methodology Center. And we're going to present a one in one workshop on latent class analysis, otherwise known as LCA. So hopefully you're in the right place. I will mention a couple times throughout the workshop. Again, just be sure to send any questions you want us to address in the second hour um, to Aaron via chat or to everybody via chat. All right, let's get started. So um, what we're going to focus on today is really just a very introductory latent cost analysis. So if you are more of an advanced user, you will probably know all of this material, but we can still talk about your questions at the end. Um, if you're brand new to the method, really what we're trying to do here is give you a conceptual introduction to latent class analysis so that you can get an idea of whether or not you'd want to take maybe a more in-depth workshop or you'd want to spend more time um, through some self-paced exercises with a book by Linda Collins and Stephanie Lanza. Um, or if you want to dig um, further and go through some of the resources that we have on the Methodology Center's website. So in order to provide this introduction, we're going to start off and talk a little bit about the model. And then we're going to talk more in more detail about an example of latent classes of adolescent drinking behavior. We're going to talk just a little bit about the parameters estimated in LCA, latent class analysis, so that um, as you read literature, you kind of know um, what they're talking about and what the mathematical model looks like. We're going to talk a little bit about the practical issues of model identification and model selection if you wanted to do this in your own work. And then we're just really briefly going to talk about grouping variables and covariates to give you a sense of kind of the next level of what you can do with these models. And then, of course, the question and answer session. It's one in one because we have a one hour lecture and then a one hour question and answer session. All right. Um, Let's get started. Okay, so there are a few abbreviations that you might hear uh, people in the field say and that we'll use during today's presentation. So LCA is latent class analysis. And what we're talking about there is a static categorical latent variable, latent variable typically that's measured with categorical items. So in the context of this presentation, we're gonna be talking about categorical latent variables with categorical items, and we're going to call that LCA. Um, if we do the same thing, measure a categorical latent variable, but now we use continuous items, I'm going to call that LPA, or latent profile analysis. The language that I'm using here is really quite interchangeable in the field, and so depending on what paper you're reading, some people might call everything a latent profile analysis, some people might call everything a latent class analysis, we can talk about why that is at the end of the talk. But just to keep things really clear about what we're talking about today, I'm going to use LCA again to mean a latent class variable with categorical items and an LPA to mean a latent class variable with, measured with continuous items. For those of you who might collect longitudinal data or even maybe saw the other video that we did about latent transition analysis, LTA is one longitudinal extension of LCA where the categorical latent class variable is dynamic and participants can move uh, between classes over time. So after this video, if you're intrigued or you have longitudinal data, there is a one-in-one -one video on LTA that is posted on the Methodology Center's website. All right, so let's um, take a look at what we're actually talking about. So let's do a really brief conceptual introduction to LCA. The basic underlying idea of all latent class models is that individuals can be divided into subgroups based on some unobservable construct. And that construct of interest is the latent variable. This is analogous to factor analysis where your continuous latent variable is the construct of interest. In this case, because our latent variable is categorical, we identify latent classes, and those latent classes represent subgroups of people in the population. 
Um, as with any lean variable model, our true class membership is unknown, and it's unknown uh, primarily due to measurement error. And because we know that there's measurement error in the assessment of our construct, we typically measure that construct based on several indicators. In this case, we're talking about several categorical indicators. So all that means, if you're more familiar with factor analysis, is just like in factor analysis where you ask participants to respond to your questionnaire um, to multiple continuous items where those items may be broken down into factors where the items hang together. Here, we have multiple categorical questions on a questionnaire that you have participants respond to. And then those um, questions are gonna work together to identify the classes and the classes are the construct of interest in this case. So our lean classes are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. And so what this means is that every person belongs to one and only one latent class, but because of measurement error, the true latent class membership is unknown. So there are primarily two sets of parameters that we're interested in with a latent class analysis. The first are latent class prevalences, um, and those just represent the sizes of the subgroups that you identify. So for example, if we're talking about drinking, perhaps we identified a class that represented people who are heavy drinkers. And so the latent class prevalence, for example, is the probability of membership in that heavy drinkers latent class maybe that's 10% of the sample. The item response probabilities are the other set of parameters that we're interested in. And the item response probabilities really tell us something about how our participants are responding. So for example, it's the probability of reporting yes to the question, did you drink five or more drinks in the past two weeks? Conditional on membership in the heavy drinkers class. So we're going to unpack this and take a look at what these item response probabilities look like. But the idea is that they provide information about how participants are responding conditional on the class. They're analogous to factor loadings in a factor analysis. And so we use this information, this probabilistic information, to label our classes. And then we can use those classes um, in further analysis if we want to. So let's try to unpack this in more detail and let's um, dig a little bit deeper into this example of adolescent drinking behavior. So we're going to focus on one particular study and we're going to walk through that study step by step in a way that is similar to what you might do if you wanted to write your own paper using latent class analysis. I know that all of you probably are not substance use researchers, so I'd encourage you to think about as I work through this example what are classes in your area that might be of interest to you? And what are those indicators that you would use to identify the classes in your population? So the example that we're using here is looking at drinking behavior in 12th grade. The data that we're gonna look at here are a bit on the old side. They're from the 2004 cohort of the Monitoring the Future public release. So we're really talking um, about a, roughly 2,500 high school seniors, and they all had to answer at least one question about alcohol use. Here, this sample was about 48% boys and 52% girls. That will come in later. Um, and so the goals of this study are, were really threefold. The first is describing alcohol use behavior among United States 12th graders. And if we were able to do that, then we might be interested in gender differences in both the measurement of those drinking classes and in the prevalence of those classes. So in the measurement and the behavior. If we can do both of those things, then we can go a step further and predict class membership from covariates such as skipping school and grades. So for example, is, uh, skipping school related to membership in um, heavier drinking classes. So this kind of step-by-step -step model building is something that you might be interested in doing in your own paper. And um, <clears throat> this, is, this would be something that we would do in any paper that we would write about LCA. We'd break the research questions down into separate um, actionable parts and each part um, corresponds to a particular model. So we're gonna walk through what those look like here. 
So in our case, we had seven questions of drinking behavior that were asked to these US 12th graders. And you can see them here. Um, we asked about lifetime alcohol use, past year alcohol use, past month alcohol use, lifetime past year and past month drunkenness, and then um, binge drinking or heavy episodic drinking, five or more drinks um, in the past two, in a single sitting in the past two weeks. If you study alcohol use, you know that there are different um, recommendations for um, males and females. At this time, monitoring the future um, did not split that into males and females. So right now we're just talking about five or more drinks. If you look at more contemporary data for monitoring the future, of course, they do follow those guidelines. So you can see here about 82% of the participants responded, yes, they had used alcohol in their lifetime. Um, and then about 26% of our participants had, had reported um, heavy episodic drinking. So the question um, that we're going to tackle first is, can we identify and describe underlying classes of drinking behavior in US 12th graders? So we have to start with that basic question and identify a high quality model first before we go on to tackle our other research questions. So we're gonna spend most of this presentation making sure that we understand this identification and description of these classes. So we're gonna come back to the steps in between model identification and selection, but for a moment, just believe that I've picked the optimal model. So I've gone through an entire process of model comparison where I look at models with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine classes, and I pick the one that I believe optimally describes the data. And we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. But once I pick a model, in this case, the five class model, the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna look at the item response probabilities. And that's what you see in this chart. So what you see down the left-hand side are the questions um, from lifetime alcohol use all the way down to heavy episodic drinking. And then across the classes, you see the five identified classes. And in the body of the table, you see the probability um, that people responded yes to an item conditional on class membership. So let's see if we can understand this. So if you look at this upper left-hand corner entry here, this 0 0.00, what this means is that conditional on membership in class one, the probability of reporting lifetime alcohol use is 0%. So people were very likely to say no to lifetime alcohol use, obviously past year and past month, and no to lifetime drunkenness, so on, and then also heavy episodic drinking. So these entries here in this column are analogous in some sense to factor loadings. And we can use these, these item response probabilities to help us figure out how we should name this class. So this chart here of our item response probabilities is the first thing that we wanna look at so that we can understand what the subgroups are that we identified. So if we look at the other end, of our chart here, class five, what we see is that um, participants in this class had very high probabilities of responding yes to alcohol use all the way um, up to and including the past month, um, high probabilities of responding yes to drunkenness, and then the highest probability of responding yes to heavy episodic drinking. So what we'd want to do is we'd want to sit here and we'd want to really absorb what this table is telling us about the patterns of responding in our data. And we'd want to use that information to label our classes. You have to be able to label the classes in some meaningful way for your latent class solution to make any sense at all. So just like in factor analysis, um, hopefully, if you're familiar with that method, you know that you need to be able to label the factors, otherwise that solution is not helpful. So here we need to be able to label the classes in a theoretically meaningful way um, in order to select a, a solution like this as optimal. So what would we name these classes? Well, class one might be fairly um, fairly easy, right? They're probably our non-drinkers. They have 0% chance of responding yes to any of our seven items about drinking. 
But what about class two? In class two, we see that they have elevated probabilities of lifetime alcohol use and past year alcohol use, but relatively low probabilities of everything else. Class three goes one step further in that they've used alcohol and they've even used it recently, but they haven't been drunk and they did not engage in heavy episodic drinking. Class four um, had high probabilities of lifetime and past year alcohol use and lifetime and past year drunkenness, but not recent alcohol use, recent drunkenness or heavy episodic drinking. So for those of you who are really engaged in the alcohol use literature, you might um, be thinking about some more sophisticated labels, but here is what we're going to call them. Uh, so class one, we labeled non-drinkers. Class two, we labeled experimenters because they have used, but um, it's unclear that they progressed in their use at all. Class three, we called light drinkers. Class four, we called past partiers because they have that um, somewhat temporal uh, issue that they have engaged in use and um, drunkenness, but not currently. And then class five, we called heavy drinkers because they were really um, engaging in all kinds of alcohol use, including heavy episodic drinking, which in this study we would consider to be the most risky form of drinking we were asking about. Once um, we've labeled the classes, then we can start to address questions that we might have actually posed as research questions. So for example, in this study, um, what proportion of the sample or the population are non-drinkers? So what proportion of high school seniors are non-drinkers and what proportion of them um, are past partiers? Well, what we saw was that about 18% of the samples in class one 22% in class two, 9% in class three, remember class three was our light drinkers, 17% in our past partiers, and then 34% uh, heavy episodic drinking, drinking or drinkers. So this gives you a flavor of once you've selected that optimal model, the very first thing that you need to do is you need to interpret the classes. And then once you've interpreted them, you can start to look at how big those classes are or what their distribution is in the population. For those of us that like graphical representations or and or are familiar more with M plus programming, this is how you could represent a latent class model graphically. So like other structural equation modeling diagrams, the latent variables are in circles and the observed variables or manifest variables are in squares. So what you see here is in the squares, we have um, our seven indicators of drinking and which reflect our drinking classes, uh, which is our latent class variable. Uh, in this case, we have reflective indicators, meaning that we believe a person's drinking class is producing the way that they're answering the questions if we're able to account for measurement error. <clears throat> so when we started diving deeper in this alcohol use example, we kind of skipped over a whole set of technical details of how do we actually select that optimal model. So we started with our research question, we need to select our optimal model, and then we can interpret it, which is what we just did. So let's unpack how you might do this um, in your own work. So let's first think about those estimated parameters. So as I mentioned earlier, we have our row parameters, our HO row parameters, which represent our um, measurement part of the model, which is our, sorry, there are item response probabilities. And then we also have our gammas and our gammas are the sizes of the classes, which we also call the latent class prevalences. So if we think about how the latent class model is working, when we have all categorical items, we think about things as um, in a contingency table framework. So here I have seven items that I asked my high school seniors about drinking. And let's say that I as an individual um, said, yes, I have drank in my lifetime and yes, I did drink in the past year. But no, I did not drink in the past month. No, I did not get drunk. And no, I did not engage in heavy episodic drinking. 
that particular response pattern, which is on the screen, Y, Y, N, 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 that is one possible response pattern that an individual could give. And that possible response pattern is one cell in the seven-way contingency table made by all of those binary questions on our survey. Now we might, <clears throat> we haven't talked about this yet, but we might also be interested in predicting class membership in the future, which we'll talk very briefly about at the end of this talk. So in order to express our latent class model, we need to figure out how to say something about our response patterns, and then also about predicting membership in those classes. And what we have on the screen now is one way to express our latent class model. And you do not have to memorize these models. In fact, latent class modeling has become so widespread now that you don't even really need to put these models in your papers anymore. Um, but we want to take a look at this really briefly just so that you can get a flavor of the pieces that go into the model. So the first part here, we just have the probability of providing a particular response pattern. So how likely am I as an individual to have given that response pattern? Yes, yes, no, 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 no. Okay. And so what we see here is we have to combine some information here about the sizes of the classes with something about the measurement of those classes. So this equation is really broken down into two parts. The part here on the right hand side, these are all of the measurement parameters of um, how likely is it to provide yes or no responses to all of the items conditional on class. And this first part of the model over here is how big is, are each of those classes. And this little x right here, again, we haven't talked about covariates, but we can unpack this x into a prediction model, which we'll look at later, which is um, given a particular level on a covariate or predictor, how likely are you to belong to each of these classes here? So again, you don't need to memorize this equation. I just want to give you some flavor of how it breaks down into its different pieces. And for those of you who maybe get really excited about math in the morning, like I do, um, these are just some technical details. The slideshow will be available for download. And so if you're reading through it after this talk, um, these are just some notes. So this would be a class model with K latent classes and some number of indicators. In our case, we've been talking about binary responses. And the key part here is that we have these gammas, this Greek gamma the probability of membership in a particular latent class. So that's our latent class membership probabilities. And then here we have the probability of providing a particular response to a particular item conditional on membership in a particular latent class. And so that is an item response probability. There are lots of them, depending on the number of classes you have. So the row parameters are critical. They are the most important part of a latent class model. And that's because fundamentally at the heart, latent class analysis is a measurement model, just like factor analysis is a measurement model. So the row parameters really drive everything about these models. And they express the relation between our discrete latent variable in an LCA and our observed indicators. So they tell us how strongly linked are our indicators to our latent class model, just like factor loadings tell us how strongly related our indicators are to our factors. So as I've said a few times, our row parameters are similar conceptually to factor loadings, and they're the basis for the interpretation of our latent classes. But <clears throat> they're probabilities between zero and one. So in a standardized factor analysis, factor loadings go from negative one to positive one. But here we're talking about probabilities, and so they range from zero to one. You can have a zero percent chance of answering yes, or you could have a hundred percent chance of answering yes, or anything in between. So our parameters, our row parameters run from zero to one. And what you want to think about partially is what is the quality of the measurement? How strongly related are the items with the latent class variable. So when a latent variable and a manifest variable completely correspond, our row parameter equals zero 
or it equals one. Both zero and one represent a really strong relation between our item and our um, latent class variable, and that's because a 0% chance or 100% chance, those are very high uh, probabilities. When a latent variable does not at all predict our, a manifest variable, meaning that the measurement quality is very low, then our row parameter equals one divided by the marginal probability for all the classes. Well, what does that mean? Well, perhaps um, we have Maybe we're thinking about a math test, and we've constructed the test such that students have a 50-50 chance of getting a particular question correct. Well, if every student in every class, um, latent class, has a 50% chance of answering the question correct or incorrect, that doesn't really tell us very much information about which class they belong to. But if we think about substance use and um, we think about perhaps an indicator of whether or not a person has used cocaine in the past year, we know that that probability in the general population is much, 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 much lower than 50%. Maybe it's, say, 8%. Well, then if you have a class where the row probability is 50%, that 50% is telling you a lot of information about cocaine use in that particular class. In fact, because overall in the population, it's only say 8%, if you have a class with 50% chance of using cocaine, that's telling you a lot about the substance use in that class. So how do we start um, understanding what kinds of rows we want? So that is when we measure a latent variable, what kind of rows would we like to see? And there are two general principles that we can use to start to provide some guidance on whether or not we have high quality measurement. These are homogeneity and latent cost separation. So homogeneity is the degree to which our row parameters for a particular latent class are close to zero and one. Remember, we want them to be close to zero or one uh, because that's very strong relationship between the class variable and the indicator. So that's fairly easy to evaluate. You can just look at them and see whether or not the item response probabilities for your classes are close to zero and one. Latent class separation is our other kind of principle that we can use. And latent class separation is really about the degree to which latent classes can be distinguished clearly from each other. So you want each class to have a unique, meaningful interpretation Otherwise, you've perhaps overextracted the number of classes. So here's an example of both high homogeneity and high latent class separation. So in this case, perhaps we're talking about um, five, say, math subtests here, maybe addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and fractions. What you can see is that both classes are well measured um, in real life. These uh, row parameters or item response probabilities are quite close to zero and one. And they also have clear, unique interpretations where class one is maybe um, poor performance or low skill, and class two is high performance or high skill because it represents high probabilities of getting all of the tasks correct. Um, high homogeneity and lower latent class separation would be something like this, where the item response probabilities, all of them are relatively close to one, but they have similar interpretations. So here, everybody in the sample is performing quite well on all of these tasks. So <clears throat> once you start doing this on your own and you start trying to interpret these models, you wanna keep the principles of homogeneity and latent class separation in mind to help you make that final choice of what your optimal model should be. Okay, so let's move in to um, two things that you must do, uh, particularly if you're using latent class analysis in an exploratory way. So the first one is model identification. And I wanna stress that every model that you consider has to be what we call well identified. And we'll take a look at what that means. But mo every model has to be well identified before you can compare models to each other. So first we're gonna talk about model identification 
And then we're going to choose about, we're going to talk about model selection once they're all well identified. So the models that we're talking about here, and most commonly, latent class models are fit using maximum likelihood estimation. If some of you are Bayesians, that's fine. You can also fit them with a Bayesian framework, but most often they're fit using maximum likelihood. And so this is not a course about maximum likelihood, but the idea is that um, a likelihood function expresses the likelihood that you see the observed data that you actually have given the model that's being fit as a function of all possible parameter estimates. So it considers all possible parameter estimates and it selects the winning parameter estimates that maximizes that likelihood function. So um, in order to make sure that you found the right value, many estimation procedures require initial values to kick off this iterative estimation procedure. And what you need to do is you have to run this iterative estimation procedure multiple times to really convince yourself that you found the true global maximum likelihood solution. If you start the iterative estimation algorithm in different places and you get different values, what that means is that you found a local maxima and you need to keep trying to convince yourself that you have really found the global maximum. The global maximum is the only one that, it, that you can report. The other ones you can't even consider. So what you wanna do is you wanna use multiple sets of starting values and you wanna see whether or not you get lots of different like log likelihood values. If you do, then the model is not very well identified. So in practice, the way that we investigate this is usually people run many different sets of starting values, say 100 or more, and then they look at the distribution of the log likelihood values or the G squared values, and they see um, how likely how confident they feel that the best log likelihood value that they identified is truly the global solution. And if it is, then they consider that model to be well identified. So you have to convince yourself for every single model that you fit that you found the true maximum likelihood solution. So if you need to do model selection, and you're fitting one, two, three, four, five, six class models, each of those models has to be well identified before you can compare them to each other in a model selection process. But if you're able to get each of them to be well identified, then you can compare them and try to select between them. So remember that we are still all in that very first step of LCA in terms of identifying and describing the classes. We have to have a lot of confidence that we've selected the optimal model for our data. So after each of the models that we're going to consider is well identified, then we can select among them. And there are two ways that you can think about model selection. One is called absolute model fit and the other is relative model fit. For those of you who do a lot of structural equation modeling, you face a similar challenge. So absolute model fit refers to whether or not a specified LCA provides an adequate representation of the data. So you want to know, does this model fit my data well in an absolute sense? But the problem or the challenge with that is that that is a statistical test. And so you're really asking, is it adequate according to some test statistic? So in order to test absolute model fit, we need the distribution of that test statistic under the null hypothesis, which is the same as every other statistical test you've ever done. So our null hypothesis is that um, the specified model fits the data well. However, the challenge in LCA, which is the same as in many other contingency table method, is that LCA computes our predicted response pattern um, according, sorry, our response pattern proportions according to the model and our estimated parameters. But usually there's a lot of sparseness in that contingency table. You don't have people answering no, they did not drink in their lifetime, and yes, they drank heavily, they've been drank in the past two weeks. So that contingency table cell would be probably empty or close to empty, which would provide sparseness across that table. <clears throat> 
And because of that sparseness, that limits our ability to do the very common test that we all want to do. So our common test statistic is the G squared or the goodness of fit test. It's similar. It's the same as the chi squared. And if we were able to do it, uh, what we would do is we would take our predicted response patterns from the model and the estimated parameters, and we would compare that to the contingency table that we actually got in real life. And the G squared measures the difference between our predicted contingency table and the one that we actually got in real life. If those are very close and they look like each other, then the model fits the data well. If they're very far apart and the G squared is big, then that means that um, the model doesn't fit the data that well. Um, so that's what we would do if we could. We want to know, does our model fit the data well in an absolute sense? But because of the sparseness I was talking about, there are severe limitations to whether or not you can actually conduct that chi-square goodness of fit test. When the data are sparse, our G-squared is not distributed as chi-squared, and it makes it very difficult to test the fit of the model. Um, and so people don't really do the goodness of fit test, the absolute goodness, fit goodness of fit test, unless they have a very small model. Instead, what they tend to do are relative model fit tests, okay? Uh, for those of you who have heard of the BLRT, the bootstrap likelihood ratio test, the bootstrap likelihood ratio test is one of the more um, popular comparative fit tests. Um, and the reason for that is because it's very tempting. And what we would want to do is to calculate the G squared difference for two competing models. So for example, let's just calculate a G squared difference between the three class model and the four class model. But we can't actually do that. We can't use the likelihood ratio test um, because we don't know the correct reference distribution. However, we can bootstrap it. So we can create an appropriate reference distribution by using this um, repetitive uh, fitting of the models and then comparing our difference to this created reference distribution. So this is the bootstrap likelihood ratio test. It's quite computationally intensive in certain software programs, but um, it's one of the favored approaches today. And so what you would do is you would compare the three class model to the four class model specifically. You would run um, a bunch of bootstrap draws in order to produce the reference distribution. And then you would compare your G squared difference to this particular reference distribution and you get a P value to tell you whether or not one of your models fits significantly better than the other. Okay. But there are lots of other ways to examine relative model fit. And so relative model fit, of course, is whether model A or model B fits better. So that's similar to the hypothesis test that we were just conducting. Fit criteria are a very popular way to do this. The two most well-known ones are the Akaiki information criterion, the AIC, and the Bayesian information criterion, the BIC. Um, but there are all sorts of other ones. Um, the sample size adjusted BIC is another popular one. The consistent AIC or the CAIC is another one. So all of these fit criteria are good tools for relative model fit. And they're all what we call information criteria, which means that we've penalized our log likelihood in some way. So all of these criteria are designed to optimize the balance between fit and parsimony. So every time we add a class or add parameters, the log likelihood gets better because the model fits better. But we also get penalized for adding parameters because every time we add parameters, it tailors the model more closely to our sample and reduces the model's generalizability. In modern software packages, I think pretty much universally for LCA, they're uh, calculated such that you want a smaller AIC and a smaller BIC. Um, these are just some equations. Again, this is really just for notes later if you download the slides. But the idea here is that all of these penalized fit criteria have a slightly different penalty. So the AIC right here is penalizing you only for the number of parameters in your model where the BIC is penalizing you both for your sample size and for the number of parameters in your model. But so what do we do with this information? What we have on the screen right now is a model selection table. And this is very commonly found in LCA papers. And what we have here 
is we just have a, a handful of the fit information, but we have the number of classes here in the left hand column. We have our G squared and our degrees of freedom. Many other software packages, we're using SAS here, but if you're using M plus or latent gold, it'd be more common to put the log likelihood and the number of parameters estimated. Then you see we have the AIC and the BIC. We also have the BLRT. So what we're looking for here is we're looking for the place where the AIC and BIC are suggesting the best balance of model fit and model parsimony. So what we're looking for is a minimum. And if you scan down the AIC column, what you can see is that it minimizes here at the five class model. The BIC does the same, also minimizes five class model. The BLRT here, um, note that the way that you um, print your BLRT in the table depends a bit. Um, I think the more common approach today would be to sh shuffle these down one. Um, so what this test, the way that we're reporting this test, there's a note here, is that the BLRT is not significant for the five class model, indicating that six classes are not needed. Typically today, because this is six versus five, we would have actually written this in the six row. Um, but really, you just need to understand what that test is telling you. And what this is telling us is that five seems quite sufficient and um, like a well-fitting model. So in this case, it's pretty obvious which model we would pick. So assuming that all of these models that we're comparing are well identified, we would choose the five class model as optimal and we would go on to interpret it and make sure that the interpretation is theoretically meaningful, which we've already seen what it is with the five classes that I talked about earlier. Okay, so let's take a little pause here for water. Make sure you're sending Aaron those questions via the chat if you have something you want to talk about at the end. We just have a few more minutes of presentation here. I just want to briefly talk about how you can expand some of these models. Um, once you've done the identification and description of the classes, what else can you do with them so that you can have really rich uh, research questions to address in your paper? So one thing you might want to do is you might want to include a grouping variable. And there's two primary reasons that you'd want to do that. The first is to explore measurement invariance. And measurement invariance is really about whether um, the items map onto the latent construct in the same way for the different groups. So let's think about in, the, in this study, Monitoring the Future, they ask the questions in such a way that it's sex and not gender. So we're going to talk about sex differences. Um, so the idea is do the items map onto the latent construct in the same way for males and females? And once we know whether or not the measurement of those classes is the same, then we might want to go further and look at how those groups compare to each other in terms of the sizes of those classes. So that's the second reason to include a grouping variable, which is to divide the sample into groups for comparison purposes. So one example would be, um, how does the probability of membership in the heavy drinkers class differ in the experimental and control conditions? One thing I want to note is that in areas that are um, maybe understudied and require a lot more work, um, theories often talk about group differences, right? Whether there are sex differences, gender differences, um, experimental versus control condition differences, whatever they are. Um, what I would encourage you to think about is whether or not those theories are talking about measurement differences or whether they're talking about size differences. Um, they could be talking about either, but I would say most of the time they're talking about size differences. So for example, um, we know that men engage in a lot more binge drinking than women um, at every age. And so what that does not necessarily mean is that the classes might be the same for men and women, but the sizes of the classes are different. So more men would be in the heavy episodic drinking class or the heavy drinkers class, and fewer women would be in the, that class, but that the classes are measured the same, okay? So these are two different features of the model. Um, in contrast to that, let's say that you study delinquency and you're interested in delinquency development from childhood all the way into emerging adulthood. Well, we know that, um, 
uh, expressions of delinquency among boys and girls are quite different, particularly in middle school. And so that actually is speaking to the construct itself and the structure of that construct. So in that case, the measurement invariance might be the more interesting question. So just keep in mind that these are two separate things that you can examine with these models. And the reason that we can examine both of these uh, features or dimensions is that when we have a multiple groups model, our row parameters can vary as a function of the grouping variable, and that's testing measurement and variance. But our gamma parameters can also vary as a function of the grouping variable, and that's what allows for the comparison of latent class prevalences. So we did indeed add a grouping variable to the latent classes of drinking behavior example that we've been talking about. And so this is just to remind you what we're doing. Remember, we started by identifying and describing, and now we're gonna add a grouping variable, in this case it's sex. And we're gonna both test for measurement and variance across males and females. And then we're also gonna look at sex differences in the prevalence of behavior types. So um, we don't have a lot of time to talk about exactly how you test measurement and variance, but the overall idea is that models um, can allow your row parameters to be freely estimated, or they can be, certain ones can be constrained to be equal across groups. And the nice part of this um, statistically is that the free and constrained models are statistically nested. So our free model allows our parameters to, differ across our groups, which means that the structure, the actual um, item response probabilities are different for males and females. Um, constrained parameters um, equate corresponding measurement parameters across groups. So um, for example, the probability of responding, no, I did not drink in my lifetime in class one for males is the same as no, I did not drink in my lifetime for females. In general, if our two models are statistically nested, um, that means that the simpler model can be arrived at by imposing parameter restrictions on the more complex model. We can do a very straightforward li log, um, likelihood ratio test. And often the goal is to fail to reject the null hypothesis so that you can actually do that direct comparison between, for example, in this case, males and females. So our null hypothesis is that the simpler model is adequate. The alternative hypothesis is that the simpler model is not adequate, and we do our likelihood ratio test. Um, and in this case, we see that it was non-significant, and so we fail to reject our null hypothesis. We um, conclude that measurement invariance is indeed plausible, and so we decide to keep our parameter restrictions. So that means that those five classes that we identified are the same for males and females. But that does not mean that the sizes are the same. And so we can move on to the second piece of that, which is six differences in probabilities of membership in drinking classes. And so for this, instead of looking at the row parameters, we're going to look at the gamma parameters. And what we see here is that given that you're male, what are the sizes of the classes? And given that you're female, what are the sizes of the classes? So um, what you can see here is that the probability of being non-drinker is the same for males and females, and it's about the same for experimenters and also for light drinkers. But we can see that the sex differences are really driven here by higher rates of um, heavy drinking among the males and higher rates of past partiers among the females. And there are ways to do significant testing on this table, but uh, that's beyond the discussion for today. So just keep in mind that you can add grouping variables both to look at the structure and um, size differences between your groups. And then of course we can also include covariates um, in order to predict membership in the classes. And so this is um, something that we also did in this study. We're just gonna take a quick look at this about the ideas of using skipping school and grades to predict what kind of drinking class membership um, you have. Again, for those of you who um, like graphical representations, here's what we're talking about. We're using skipping school to predict our drinking classes, which are measured from our seven items. So what we're talking about here really is regressing our latent class variable. 
on our covariates. Um, and so that's a logistic regression with a latent outcome. There's nothing particularly um, special about that other than the latent outcome. And so we're still talking about regression. Beta parameters are going to express the relation between our covariates and our class membership. You can put in any kind of covariates that you want. If it goes in a regression model, you can put it in a model like this. But now, because that outcome is categorical, right, we're trying to predict membership in our categorical classes, we need to think about multinomial logistic regression. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're looking at regression coefficients, in this case it's beta 1, 1, that um, influence the log odds of belonging in a particular latent class compared to a reference latent class. And so this would be um, how does skipping school influence the log odds of membership in, say, the past partying latent class compared to the non-drinkers latent class. So there's a lot of potential comparisons. Again, we're not going to get into a lot of detail about logistic regression here, I'm just trying to give you a flavor for the kinds of questions that you can answer. Um, with these beta parameters, because the outcome is categorical, we can, of course, exponentiate the beta parameters to get odds ratios, and odds ratios are interpreted in this context exactly um, as in other contexts. And so here, um, again, talking about skipping school and grades, you see skipping school was dummy coded, so it's just a binary predictor. Grades, however, was a continuous predictor and it was standardized. Um, in this case here, the covariates were entered into separate models, but you can add them simultaneously. Again, it's just a regular regression model. And just to keep this straightforward, we use non-drinkers as a reference group for that multinomial logistic regression. When we put these into the model, we can get an overall significance test that's um, just really a global significance test of whether or not the covariates are at all related to class membership. Unsurprisingly, skipping school and grades are strongly linked to class membership. And this might be an example of how you could present these results. So down the left hand side are the classes. We have skipping school, um, betas and odds ratios, and then grades, we have betas and odds ratios. And what you can see here, skipping school was coded one, not skipping school was coded zero. So you can see that um, the odds increase um, for each of the other classes compared to the reference class for those who skipped versus not skipped. And for grades, what you can see is that as grades increase, the odds of belonging to each of these classes compared to the reference class decrease. So let's try to interpret one just to give you a flavor of what's going on here. And so what you can see here is that the odds of membership in the heavy drinkers class relative to the non-drinkers class is five times higher for adolescents who skip school relative to those who did not skip. So again, um, we can talk more about this in the question and answer session and unpack kind of what's going on here. But I just wanted to give you a flavor of what grouping variables and covariates could look like in this context. All right, so we're going to take a little pause here and turn off the slideshow. So just uh, take them in the order they come. So the first question we had, we had was, um, I'm not sure if we're set up to do this, but it was a question, would you please run a model with items that have more than two character categories and then interpret the results? We, we're not set up to do that at this webinar, but can you talk about yeah. Um, mm. Models where the items have more than two categories. Yeah. So the I, so in a case where the items have more than two categories. So in terms of running the model, running it um, on the computer, it depends on how you actually code that. Depends on the software package that you're using. If you're using SAS, it's really quite easy. Um, your variables have to be coded. Um, one, two, three, four, et cetera, depends on um, how many categories you have. Uh, the reason for that is because cat uh, SAS treats everything as um, nominal, and so it just counts up the number of categories. So you would code it correctly, and then you would indicate how many categories that that item has. So if it was a four category item, you would just put in four in the little statement. If you are using um, M plus, or latent gold, what you have to do is you can actually start coding them at zero if you want, zero, one, two, three, four, 
or zero, one, two, three in this case. Um, and all you have to do is you just have to specify that the items are categorical. And when you specify that they're categorical, they should count up the number of categories. What the output looks like is um, it looks like a much um, bigger version of um, the table that I'm presenting. So the table that I presented here only had um, two response categories, yes and no. So you only have to present half of them. So we were only presenting the yes responses, but there are a set of item response probabilities for the yes responses and for the no responses. When you have more than one category, you really have to present all of them. Um, and so for example, you might have one where there's a 30% chance of answering response category one, and um, a 20% chance of answering response category two, and then a 50% chance of answering response category three. So um, sometimes you usually have to stare at the models with more than one response um, for quite a while just to make sure that you know what it's telling you. And um, I'm gonna show you one thing real quick that might be helpful. Yeah, right here. Um, uh, okay, so I'm sorry that these are in black, but hopefully you can see this okay. So here's an example where two of the items have, have three categories and two of the items have two categories. So right here, um, the indicators are number of dating partners and in parentheses are how many partners. So you could answer zero, one, or two or more. And then whether or not you had sex in the past year is binary. And the number of sex partners in the past year has three categories, zero, one, or two. And then whether or not you're exposed to STIs is either no or yes, so that one's binary. So if you have more than two indicators, this is the kind of table that you would wanna present probably. And the way that, but the way that you interpret them isn't any different. It's still, so if you look at, um, let's look at, um, yeah, this table here. So right here, this is just a reduced version. It's just showing you which ones were elevated. So right here, we labeled um, class three monogamous. And that's because um, here for dating partners, they had an elevated probability of that second response category, meaning that they only had one dating partner and they only had one sex partner in the past year. As compared to class four and class five here, that had elevated probabilities of answering two or more. Um, and so one was labeled multi-partner safe and one was labeled multi-partner exposed based on their condom um, use here. So just to take one more quick look at that, that's what that looks like. So right here is this elevated probability for the multi-partner safe and here's the elevated probability for multi-partner exposed. And then for monogamous, you can see the elevated probability right here. So that would be um, given that you belong to class three, 97% responded that they had had one sex partner in the past year. So I'm sorry, I can't show you how to run it, but hopefully that um, is a little bit helpful. Oh, yes, sorry. Nope. <laughs> Responding to users online. Okay. Um, is there a required minimum sample size for LCA? Yeah, so sample size for LCA has a lot to do with the quality of the measurement. So the more strongly that your classes are measured, um, the fewer people that you need in your sample to identify them. Um, but there's no real good um, like base sample size. So when I started working in latent class models, we used to say that you needed like 300 people, but that was just a totally off the wall rule of them. Um, you can have, I've seen latent class models published with 75 people. It really depends on a few different things. One is that your model is well identified. So if you cannot reliably find the global maximum likelihood solution, you have too few people. Um, otherwise, it's really going to determine how many classes you can find. And so if you have a sample from the exact same population, if you have a sample of 100 people, 
maybe you'll find three classes. But if you have that exact same population and you have a sample of 5,000 people, maybe you'll find seven classes. Um, there's a good paper um, by Ziak et al. It's D-Z-I-A-K. It's about the power of the bootstrap likelihood ratio test. Um, I think the paper was in structural equation modeling, I think. Um, it's And it talks about um, how many classes can you identify in different scenarios? So that's a really inadequate answer probably. Um, you have to, uh, if you already have the data collected and you're doing secondary data, it's a bit of an empirical question of how many do you identify and are they useful given that your models are um, stable in the sense that you can identify maximum likelihood solution. Um, but the more people you have, the more classes you can identify. So it's really more about how many are you going to find, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Um, what if you're working with survey data that's a mix of categorical, categorical and continuous scaled questions? Yeah, so um, there are a couple different answers to that. So I use the words, this is not, this is just a personal preference because I work with the models a lot to keep them straight in my head. Um, there's no specific limitations that, there, there's no rule that says you can only have all categorical items or that you can have only all continuous items. You can have what I call mixed indicator models that have both categorical and continuous items in them at the same time. Um, there are a couple things to keep in mind if you're going to do that. One is that if you're going to use continuous items in a model, you need to make sure that you really believe that those items are normally distributed conditional on class. So the assumption of a latent profile model is multivariate normality conditional on class. So if you have super, super, super highly skewed items, that assumption could potentially still be plausible, but I think you'd have a hard time convincing other people of that. Um, I also think that, so the second point I wanted to make about mixed indicator models is that they have sort of a reputation for um, being difficult to interpret because you have to mix the interpretation of means. So what is the average on the scale conditional on class with the item response probabilities? So I definitely, if you are a beginner, would highly recommend that the way that you start is by discretizing your items and fitting some models so that you can get the hang of it. And then if you need to enrich those models to then include um, continuous items or change your indicators back to being continuous or whatever, um, because I think starting off with mixed indicator models is quite tough. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that was too many. Um, do you add covariates when you're estimating the classes? Do you add covariates when you're estimating the classes? Uh, no, you do not add covariates when you're conducting model selection. So you want to do model selection in the absence of any covariates or outcomes or anything like that. Um, Grouping variables is a bit of a different story. It depends on um, how you approach grouping variables depends on kind of a priori theory and what you think is going to happen. So if you don't have a strong reason to think that the measurement is really different between your groups, then what I would recommend is conducting model selection on the full sample and then confirming measurement and variance through a likelihood ratio test. If you have a lot of theory that suggests your groups are super different, then you might want to do model selection in the groups separately and see how similar they are before putting them together and doing overall model selection. But covariates is an easier question. Do not do model selection with covariates in the model. Okay, thanks. What are the major differences between LCA and LPA, practically speaking, apart from the obvious categorical versus dimensional distinction? Yeah, uh, probably, probably the two biggest things is, um, so L, latent profile models, so that's, those are the ones with continuous items. Um, anecdotally speaking, 
the um, fit information is less helpful in latent profile models than in latent class models. So in my personal experience, almost all of the latent profile models I have fit, the fit information continues to improve as you add more and more and more classes. That often happens in LCA, okay, it does. But um, the fit information in LCA tends to give you more helpful information. I've seen many, many, many latent profile models where um, you really have to just kind of do model selection based on understanding how the classes are extracted because the fit information isn't helping. In LCA that can happen, but it happens much more frequently in my experience in LPA. That's probably the most pro Practically speaking, that's probably the biggest challenge of using LPA. The other thing with LPA is that because you're interpreting means instead of item response probabilities, means are not bounded unless you have a bound on your scale. And so it can be difficult to determine if your variances are very small on your items, are two classes sufficiently separated can, it can sometimes be a more challenging thing to figure out than whether the item response probabilities are different. So practically speaking, I, in my experience, um, model selection is more difficult with LPA and um, inter model interpretation can also be more difficult. Ooh, and I'll say one more thing about that. In latent profile models, there's often this phenomenon, which we could talk more about at some point, um, where there's a class that's left over that is like the average class. I think of it as like a residual class. That's because of the way latent profile modeling works partially is that it tries to identify classes that are as far apart from each other as possible. And then there's always this kind of average class left over. And that average class often is the largest class. And so depending on your theory, that can be somewhat um, dissatisfying if everybody's just average. So I, those, those are kind of the big things. I mean, I could talk about it. I could talk about just that question for an hour, but I think that's a, that's probably the big, big take homes. Yeah. <laughs> um, is the BLRT definitely preferred to the low Mendel Rubin LMR or adjusted LMR test yes. in this context for determining yes. the number of latent classes? Yes. Yes. Would you say yes? Yes. <laughs> so just to be clear, um, the BLRT is it one hundred. Yes, is preferred in the latent class analysis context. There have been plenty of simulations to show that the BLRT is better than the LMR. Now, the caveat to that is with latent profile analysis, we don't know that to be true. The only thing that we do know, the simulations have all been conducted in LCA. Um, so what we tend to think of is that the LMR um, is super conservative. It would pick a model that's far too small. And the BLRT is less conservative and it tends to be um, too generous. You tend to pick models that are too big. Um, and so the LMR honestly is the only one that tends to do something in latent profile models which makes me suspicious of it, um, but at the same time can also be the one that's only providing anything that's helpful. But the thing is, we don't know how well it's working at all. And based on the LCA work, 100% the BLRT instead of the LMR is the way to go. <laughs> I'm strongly opinionated about that. Yeah. Can you talk about the three-step method described in Lanza et al. 2013 versus the BCH method? Um, yes, I can. Um, okay, so here's the thing. The Lons et al. method, we're going to call it the LTB method because um, I don't have to say the whole thing every time. So LTB just stands for Lanza, Tan, and Bray. That's who wrote the paper, LTB. Um, the LT, this is the short explanation, okay? The take-home message is that the LTB approach is not um, robust to violations of a really critical assumption. And that assumption is that when you have uh, continuous outcomes, the variance of that outcome has to be the same in every class. And small violations of that assumption produce pretty poor results in the LTB approach. So if you have continuous outcomes, the LTB approach is not recommended. 
If you have continuous outcomes, the BCH approach works really super well. The primary difference between them, which is what I think actually your question was, is that the LTB approach, it, um, it uh, for continuous outcomes, it uses a kernel density estimator and combines that with Bayes' theorem to produce the distribution of the outcome within each class. The BCH approach works the same if it's continuous or categorical. The idea, the basic idea is that you quantify the amount of um, classification error in the modal classifications. Sorry, oh, I might make it, sorry. I'm getting worked up, uh, super <laughs> fun. Um, okay, so it, uh, it adjusts for classification error in the modal assignment. So you basically you quantify the classification error from your model, and then you reweight the outcome analysis to produce the correct means within the classes. Now, please note that when I say weighting by classification error, that is not the same thing as just putting in a weighting variable into an analysis. So please do not print out the BCH weights, import them into another software program and treat them like regular weights. They are not, and that analysis will not be correct. We can have an advanced discussion about why that is, but um, I hope if you have a follow-up question, I don't know if I'm really hitting on your exact thing you wanted to know, but um, yeah, you, you, okay, that's there might summary. be time to follow up. Yeah, yeah. Um, is it possible to make pairwise comparisons rather than selecting a reference class, or rather select different classes in the same analysis? Yeah, so um, so pairwise comparisons are printed out in every software package. So um, I didn't present them here, just in interest of space. But what you get or what you can produce, different software packages print out different things. But you can always get um, the global test, which is what I actually had on the slide, and then you can test pairwise differences between each target class and the reference. So for every um, beta that was on the slide for the covariates, there is a, a, a test which tells you whether or not the reference class is different from each target class. But you can change the reference class so that you can get all of the pairwise comparisons. I would not recommend that necessarily. That's a lot of testing. And so, but they do all print out if you want all of them, you can get all of them. Um, the overall significance test will always stay the same, um, but every time you change the reference then you get a new set of pairwise comparisons. Um, what I would recommend is picking maybe like two reference classes. So in this example, I picked non-drinkers. It's unsurprising that our other four drinking classes were different on skipping school and grades, right? We probably already knew that. But maybe my question really is about our past partiers different from heavy drinkers because that's where the males and females were different. And so are they different on skipping school and grades? In that case, what I would do is I would change the reference class to be the heavy drinkers class so that I could get each target class compared to the heavy drinkers class. So there's nothing different about these models than a regular um, logistic regression, uh, multinomial logistic regression model. Thank you. What is the best way to keep up to date on these methods mm. if you are a user rather than someone who studies methods in depth? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, watch a video like this? <laughs> um, I think, you know, honestly, a lot of, a lot of things that are pretty, um, are pretty settled about latent class models, like, Pretty much everything that we're talking about right now is reasonably settled with the exception of this um, BCH outcome covariate thing, which we can talk more about. So um, I think that the best way to stay up to date is to, ah, there are two things. One is that you must, you must, I cannot stress this enough. If you don't remember anything from this webinar, except for what I'm about to say, make it this you must update your software packages, okay? Don't use an M plus version that is two versions out of date. Don't use an LCA plugin that's two versions out of date. The best way to make sure that you're doing the best practice 
is by using the current version of the software because the same people who are writing these papers are producing the software. And so if you stay up to date with your version and your software manual, there's often really, really good tips in the manual or on the online documentation that moves much faster than the publications. Okay, no, I, no methodologist is gonna expect you to read all of the papers that are coming out in structural equation modeling. And we were all fighting for about four years about what the right method is. But once we were sure, everybody implemented it in their software around the same time and updated their user's guides. So I think that the best that you can do as an applied scientist is using the most current recommendations in the software packages that you're using. But again, I stress that that means the most current version of the software. And I know that that costs money and I'm really sorry about that, but that is the best way to do it. Another good way is if there are some methodological papers that, um, that you see coming out or something that you've heard about, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to look for that same author who's written a, an applied paper. So what I mean is if you're following like the work of me or the work of Stephanie or the work of Bank Nutain or Jacques Hagenars, right? These are all people doing methodological work. If you look us up and you look for a paper that seems like applied, like I have plenty of papers about um, family-based interventions or um, alcohol use among emerging adults. In those papers, I am going to use what I think is the best approach for doing that. And then you don't need to read all of the technical papers that I wrote explaining why. All you need to do is say, oh, Bethany or Banks or Stephanie just wrote a paper using this method um, for the outcomes, maybe. Um, so we're going to do that. And the other thing that I would say about that is just know that methodological development of these models is ongoing. And so what is recommended when you write a paper today might not be the method that we're going to recommend two years from now and that that's okay. That doesn't mean you did anything wrong or that we did anything wrong. It just means that it's a science and it's moving forward and we're going to have better recommendations in two years. So don't, um, don't get discouraged, I guess, is the other thing I'd say. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between LCA and cluster analysis? And what are the strengths and weaknesses of each? Yeah, so that's um, a little bit long to go into. I'm going to recommend that you look at a really brief paper. Overall, the basic differences between cluster analysis and LCA is that they're both used to identify subgroups in a sample or in a population. Cluster, uh, mm, latent class analysis, um, I think people think that there are two primary differences. The first is that LCA comes from a measurement tradition, okay? It's a philosophy that you want to examine and estimate measurement error, and you want to try to account for that in your model. Cluster analysis comes out of a totally different tradition. It's, um, it's, kind, of like, it's kind of like the difference between principal components analysis and factor analysis, right? Principal components is a mathematical approach. It will always work. Factor analysis is a measurement model philosophy with um, a log likelihood and an estimation, iterative estimation procedure. Cluster analysis is a mathematical procedure that will always work. You will always get clusters. They may or may not make sense theoretically. Um, it does not have, it's not the same kind of log likelihood model-based approach as LCA. So in LCA, you can evaluate the fit compared to your theoretical model and it comes out of this measurement philosophy and tradition. Um, the pros and cons, you know, there's not, not a lot. I mean, you could pick either one equally well. You know, methods come in and out of fashion. I would say right now cluster analysis is out of fashion and LCA is in fashion. But, you know, older literature, cluster analysis was in fashion and people did it. Um, but there is a good paper that really briefly summarizes the basic differences between these. It is, um, yes, it is a paper by J. Magdison, M-A-G-I-D-S-O-N, and Vermont, V-E-R-M-U-N-T. Um, it came out in 20, uh, no, 2002. It's called Latent Class Models for Clustering, a Comparison with K-Means.
it just it's like a three page little just summary of the differences between LCA and cluster analysis. Um, yeah, so I think those are kind of the, the take home messages. Okay. Is LCA suitable for ordered categorical or ordinal items? Yeah, so um, you can put ordinal items into an LCA, but it just fits it as nominal. Right, because um, for something to be treated truly ordinal, you need a truly ordinal model, which would be something like um, uh, proportional odds, for example, or um, you know, cumulative odds or something like that. I actually don't know of a software program that would impose the proportional odds assumption on indicators. So if you put in ordinal indicators, you have an option. You can either treat them as categorical, in which case you're going to get item response probabilities for each of your ordered categories, or if there are enough ordered categories that they lie on vaguely sort of a continuum, you could put them in as continuous and what you would get is the mean on that ordered scale within the classes. But there's no like true ordinal model. If you could fit that, um, my money would be on latent gold, but I don't think they let you specify like proportional odds or something. Can you go over when a model is well identified one more time? Yeah, so a model is well identified when you have a lot of confidence that you truly did find the global maximum likelihood solution. And usually the way that people develop that high level of confidence is that they run many, many different sets of random starting values and they make sure that those random starting values end up hitting the same log likelihood solution. Um, so in SAS, for example, if you run it with 100 sets of random starts, it will tell you the proportion of times those starts hit the same solution that's printed in the output. So like 80%, that's a great number, 2%, less good number. In M plus, they don't print out a proportion and that's because most people use a two-stage optimizer. And so what you're looking for there is they do print out a long list of um, log likelihoods and you wanna make sure that the best one is replicated enough times that you feel confident if you had not just run one more random start that you wouldn't have gotten something better. Okay, uh, Lane Gold also will print off a, a list of log likelihoods for you. But their estimation procedure is pretty, I don't know how they get it to narrow in on the right one so often, but they do a little bit better job. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, uh, I butchered that question. I have to go back and find it again. Oh. Um, are there any challenges or benefits of using repeated measures as indicators within an LCA? Okay, so by repeated measures, so there are two ways to think about repeated measures. I am going to assume that what you mean is um, sort of redundant indicators where you have like multiple indicators of basically the same thing. So people have different schools of thought about that. Um, I think that that is a good thing because it strengthens the quality of your measurement model However, you have to be careful to not put too many in, otherwise you have too many indicators and it can make your model difficult to identify. So this is a very common criticism that you'll see of latent class models, sorry, of latent class models, that um, what you get is people think you only need one indicator of one dimension. But in factor analysis, everybody knows you need three or more, right? I don't know what the disconnect is there. Um, with latent class models, because they're often categorical, you have to be careful to not overwhelm the model, but some redundant information can be good. And so if you have like two indicators of a particular dimension that you want to put in there, I think that can be a good thing. Again, because it strengthens the measurement model. Thanks. Um, someone wanted to know, wanted you to verify this statement. The rows are estimated and those can be compared to the observed probabilities to evaluate fit. Is that correct? No. Um, I don't know quite what you're trying to say. So you can compare 
the estimate, the item response probabilities that are estimated to the overall marginal probabilities in your sample to try to get a sense at the quality of the measurement and the latent class separation. But you, um, and that might help you choose between two models, but it wouldn't really provide a, a, a strong um, assessment of model quality, I guess, is probably what I would say. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what is the most common criticism or concern you get from reviewers when you <laughs> use LCA? Uh Oh, I could give a whole lecture just on that. Um, so I think one, so one common criticism is the one that I answered about that kind of like redundant information in the model. That's pretty common. Um, another common one is, um, oh, the power, that's kind of a common one too. And so you just, you respond, like, they want to know, was there enough power to detect more classes? Well, probably not, otherwise you would have detected them. But you, you combat that criticism by talking about the quality of, uh, sorry, the identification, whether or not the model is useful in a theoretical sense. Um, I think that people react to the power issue because people have a tendency to reify the classes. That means assume that the classes are the absolute truth, which is not the case. Lane class analysis is a model just like any other model. And we all know the famous quote that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And so um, the classes don't exist in an absolute sense. This is a parsimonious way to explain the heterogeneity in your sample. And so you have to be careful to not over attribute those classes. And I think that that causes reviewers to be like, well, what if, you know, this person doesn't fit in this class, right? Because you could have a person in your sample whose response pattern makes it very re reasonably unlikely for them to belong to any of the classes. And that, it, again, that's just, it's an artifact of the measurement model. This is one thing people like about cluster analysis, I think a little bit better sometimes, is that people clearly belong to a class and not to the other classes. Um, I think that the biggest criticism that latent class modeling gets overall is that no interesting classes are identified and the only solutions I have ever seen in the literature are high, medium, and low classes. My, and people might not be that harsh in a review, but in general, my response to that criticism is that I personally think latent class modeling has sort of developed that reputation because of poor applications. Um, so latent class models work the best and they're designed to work the best when you have multiple dimensions in your latent class model, and what you're trying to do is identify classes that truly have different patterns. And the reason for that is, think about what happens when you put in, or think about what would happen if you put in five items from a very, very well-developed continuous scale, right? This is a unidimensional, scale that looks super good when you factor analyze it. Well, if you put these items into that, what you're going to do is you're going to artificially discretize a continuous factor into high, medium, and low classes. And so if you put in items that are not representing multiple dimensions, what you get are high, medium, and low on the one dimension that you did put in there. And so by far, I think that that is the biggest criticism of latent class modeling. And I think that criticism comes from a long history of relatively poor applications. Thank you. Can you explain one more time about the reasons to use groups in LCA? Yeah. So groups, um, you would put in a grouping variable for two primary reasons. The first reason is that you want to look at the actual structure of the classes. That is, you want to see whether or not 
the item response probabilities are different for one group compared to another group. So that would be um, whether or not the classes for men look very different from the classes from women in terms of their patterns of item response probabilities. So that's the first reason. That's the measurement invariance reason. The second reason is if you do have measurement invariance and your classes do look the same for your groups, the second reason that you could put in a grouping variable is to see whether or not the sizes of the classes are significantly different for your groups. So the classes of drinking might be the same for men and women, but are the sizes of the classes the same for men and women? Thanks. Is it possible to test for moderation? This is a two part question. Well, so moderation on there, I'm going to give a two, two part answer to the first part. Yeah. Um, so moderation, um, would be in some sense, if you put in a grouping variable, right? So moderation, that word means that you have to look at the effect of a variable on another variable and whether or not that effect is different, right? But most of this talk was only about the latent class variable. And so moderating the latent class variable, really there, there isn't an effect, right? Moderation is something about an effect. But if you think just about the class variable, you moderate the latent class variable by looking at group differences, which is the grouping variable. Now, if you're thinking about the part, this is part two of the first part. Um, if you're thinking about the effect of a latent class variable on an outcome, or you're thinking about the effect of a covariate on latent class variable, yes, you can moderate those effects. And if you think about the covariate piece of it, what I said was that you can fit any regression model that you can fit in any other context. So how do we fit moderation? We regress our outcome, our latent class variable, on our predictor and our moderator and on an interaction term between those two, right? That's the regression model that we would fit. And so if you wanted to do moderation in this context, you would put in your two main effects and your interactive effect in that regression model predicting latent class membership. So yes, you can do moderation in, in pretty much any sense of the word. Yeah. And they said, if yes, is it preferable to include interactions among covariates or to use a multi-group approach? Um, so it depends on, um, on what the goal is and how lazy you are. <laughs> so what I would say is, um, if what you want to do is you want to physically look at the betas, the effects for males and for females, what I would do is I would put in a grouping variable for sex, and then I would regress the latent class membership on the covariate of interest. And that moderates the entire model. So you get a set of betas for males and you get a set of betas for females. So you can put them in your paper, look at them and interpret them. What you don't get though, is a significance test of whether or not specific ones are different for males and females. So you can run the model again and put in your two main effects in your interaction term. And then you can look at the significance of your interaction term uh, to find out which ones are significant. So if you're me and you're super lazy, you just run it both ways and you pull what you want off the output. <laughs> but it's the same model. As long as you have measurement invariance on the grouping variable model, whether you do interaction terms in a regression or you do uh, grouping variable, um, those are the same model. You should get the same log likelihood, actually. What do the rows look like in a latent profile analysis? Are they means? Yes, yeah, so in a latent profile model, what you get is you get um, means within each class. Um, give me one, just one second. Can maybe give you an example. Let's see. Yeah, here. Um, Okay, again, I'm sorry it's black, but this is just what I had handy. 
Okay, so here what you see, this is an example of a table that you might present in LPA. So here what I had was like, I don't know, 17 um, Likert items. Um, were, were you sincere? Were you compassionate? Or, or rather, how sincere, how compassionate, how sensitive? We have the overall item mean. So this is the overall marginal mean in the sample. And then we identified four classes. And each of the, these is the mean of the item within that class. Now you also get a variance, right? So you get a mean and a variance. Um, but in lane profile models, often the variances are constrained to be equal um, for each item across class. And that is to improve model identifiability. Because if you estimated a mean and a variance for each of these items, it's a lot of parameters. So in this case, the, mean, the variances are not printed in this table, but they were constrained to be equal. So there was 17 variances and there were 17 times four means that were estimated. Thanks. Um, for a SAS user, can you suggest specific references resources or links for the syntax for LCA, LPA, and LTA? Yes, I can. So if you go to the Methodology Center's website, all of the SAS syntax for all, almost all of the models that are in the Collins and Lanza book are available for free download. So it's a huge um, repository of code, um, which I think you get to under publications. Well, I'll get the URL. Just yeah, Aaron's yeah. going to look up the URL and paste it in the in the um, chat window. Chat window. Yeah. So that's probably the best place to get started. There's tons and tons of examples um, from the book. Uh, I'm still looking for that, but uh, let me. The next question: um, What is the best software, in your opinion, to fit LCA models? Oh my goodness! Somebody's just stirring up trouble this afternoon. Um, so I, I honestly, I can say honestly that I do not have a favorite piece of software. I use three pieces of software quite routinely, and I will tell you when I use them and maybe that will help. So um, SAS, so PROC LCA for SAS, which is a user created plugin that we distribute here at the Methodology Center. That is my go-to piece of software that I use any time that I want to get started on a new model. And the reason for that is because I've been using it a long time. It's very simple. The output is very straightforward. I understand how it works really well. Um, but, oh, but it only will allow categorical indicators. So if I have continuous indicators or if I need to do a more complicated model where I'm relating latent class membership to everything in the universe, then I need to use a more flexible piece of software. So I will start by fitting the models in SAS to make sure that I have the ones that I want and that I understand what should be happening. And then I will import that either into M plus or into latent gold um, so that uh, I can be sure that the model that I'm fitting is the one that I want because it can be quite easy to program the wrong model in M plus especially. So I just like to be super sure. And I will tell you, even after 17 years, I still do this. Okay, so don't, <laughs> if you're a new user, don't be shy about starting in something that's easier and moving to something more flexible later. I do it literally every day. So um, if I, again, if I have continuous indicators or a more complicated model, then I will import it into M plus or into latent gold, depending on what I'm doing. So I have a preference for the estimation and the science behind the latent gold software, but M plus um, is more flexible. And so it depends on what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do, um, whether or not I'm trying to create some sample code for somebody who only has one license or another. Um, so I think if you, if you have limited funds, and you had to pick a piece of software, one piece of software only, um, if you, what you want to do is mixture modeling, broadly speaking, mixture modeling, I would go with latent gold. If you need to be able to fit all sorts of different kinds of structural equation models, um, 
complex survey weighting, all that kind of stuff, then, and you could only pick one piece of software, then you probably should go with M plus. Okay. If you're a beginner, go with SAS, hands down. It's the easiest. <laughs> Um, when you are using national data sets, for example, NHANES, how can you do LCA when you are using stratified and clustered data? Yeah. Are there any other approaches that can be used if LCA isn't adequate? Well, so there's nothing special about LCA and complex survey data. You just have to use a package that will adequately deal with the complex survey weights. So depending on how many levels of weights you have, SAS will include one level of weights, uh, Lane Gold, I think, will include two levels of weights. Maybe, yeah, maybe two, maybe three. I can't quite remember, two or three. And M plus will do, I think, two. So um, all they just use robust estimators to um, to get the proper standard errors given your complex survey design. Um, and they will. You can either put in the cluster statement, or you could put in. Two, up to two weighting statements. Again, SAS only has cluster and one weighting statement, but um, you can use clustering, you can use two weighting statements in certain kinds of software, and it adjusts the standard errors. I will say, if you have a complex survey and you want to do weighting on it, you must do model selection with all of that stuff on there, okay? You can't do model selection without it because it changes the power to identify your classes. Um, the other thing I will say is that the BLRT does not work with those complex schemes. And so you just, you might just have to remind your reviewers because they might complain about that with, while forgetting that it only works with like basic uh, data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you recommend any user-friendly resources for latent profile analysis? Yeah, that's tough. Well, I, in one year, which is not at all helpful, in one year <laughs> I, can, I can recommend to you our newly formed code repository that I will have programmed latent profile models in, but sadly there's not a lot uh, I can recommend right now. Um, what I would say, if you need a resource about how to write about it, um, I would recommend um, one of my papers, either the Fosco and Bray paper that ha is in a family journal, or a paper that's first authored by my student, Sarah Perzo, um, which is about stress coping, um, or a paper where I'm first author with Roseanne Fodi, a second author in Leadership Quarterly. Those are all, I think, good examples of how you can write about it. If you need um, code examples, um, uh, if you need code examples, I could share at least one. You could email me. There's not really a good place to find a lot of those samples. The citation is Fosco and Bray 2016 in the Journal of Family Psychology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I like that paper. It's a good. That's a good paper, I think, for a balance of like not going over, you don't have to explain a whole lot about the method, but you have to explain a little bit about the method. I like that paper. Is there any restriction for the number of categories for an item? For example, is an item with nine categories okay? And if you say yes, John Ziak is gonna watch this video. <laughs> Nine categories is too many, I'll just say that. Um, so here's the thing about multiple category indicators. There are a couple different things you have to think about. One is that you really, really need to be cognizant of the size of your contingency table, right? And the size of your contingency table depends on the number of items and the number of categories that they have. So in, in our case here, we had seven binary items. So the size of our contingency table was two times two times two times two times two times two times two. Okay, not ginormous, but pretty big. If you had seven nine category items, the size of your contingency table would be nine times nine times nine times nine times nine times nine times nine. Times nine, times nine. Okay, I, you probably have, even if you had a couple thousand people, the contingency table is huge. The bigger the contingency table, the more difficult it is to identify your model and the way more difficult it is to interpret the items. 
So um, if you have a nine category response, I would look at the distribution of your responses and see if you can collapse any. If it's ordinal or vaguely continuous, nine levels, if it's relatively normally distributed, I would try to fit it as continuous and see what happens first. Um, but if they're truly nine unique, discrete categories, um, you could think about um, you could think about whether you wanted to make a couple of um, you know binary ones. So did you answer response one or two? That would be one indicator. Did you answer response seven, eight, or nine? That would be another indicator. So how you exactly deal with indicators depends a lot on how many you have, how many eat, how many response categories each of them has, and the empirical distribution of the responses to those indicators. In gen, if you had two nine category indicators, I guess that might be okay. But um, I don't, I don't even know what that would look like. So to better answer the question, I need to know what the question, like what, what the response categories are, and I could make a better recommendation. Yeah, it's still hard to imagine if, if someone can only have data on, on two well, of the nine categories, right? Then no, 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 they could only have one right data on one category. So one, one reasonable example would be like, what, um, what industry, what type of industry do you work for? That would be, that could be a nine category single item, but then you would probably want to break it down. That's why I need to know yeah, what the question it, it, is. It, it's LCA really going to, anyhow. I don't um, know, it depends on the context. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> can you talk about approaches to correlating multiple latent class indicators? I'm not sure what that question means. Um, so there are two things that you could be talking about. Um, so in the overall data, we would expect the indicators to be correlated. That, that's totally why we would want to do a latent class model. So um, the latent class variable, um, in some sense, is a way to examine correlations between the items. So I'm, I'm assuming that's not what you mean. What you might mean is residual correlations among the items, and that's a bit of a philosophical question. So the, um, in general, the models that people usually fit assume conditional independence, um, just like factor analysis, in that um, after I know what your latent class variable level is, then the indicators are independent. Okay, that's a very common assumption in any latent variable model. That assumption can be relaxed, and you can uh, allow residual correlations among items, uh, but I think, I personally think that you have to have a really good reason to do that. Um, usually, I have never published a model that has residual correlations. I don't find them to be that compelling because I think that they mess up the interpretation of the class model. I also think that that's the case in factor analysis, but lots of people disagree with me and that's totally fine. Um, there is a very famous example in latent class modeling of residual correlations in the general social survey. It's um, on questions I think about abortion. And the model selection tells you that if it's either a three class model with no residual correlation, or it's a two class model with one residual correlation. And that's a bit of a philosophical question of if you think, when you look at the interpretation of the classes, what is the correct, correct quote unquote, correct interpretation? Um, if you have residual correlations that are unaccounted for and they're particularly strong, what that means when you select your model is typically you would over extract. So if you start to get classes that have really similar interpretations, um, that it could be a cause. So it's, I, you know, I'm going to kind of plead the fifth or something on that question. It's, um, you can do it. You need a flexible piece of software to do it like M plus or latent gold. But it's possible, I just, um, I'm not a big fan. Uh, last question, uh, unless one comes in uh, under the wire here. I wonder if we can use a two-stage approach by first generating the class membership in LCA and later use the membership in a regression model to predict an outcome. So um, 
when you assign people to latent classes and then you use those class assignments in further analysis later, you severely underestimate the parameters in that second step model. Okay. And this is, we were talking earlier about the LTB and BCH pro approaches. There was like five years of arguments in the literature about what to do in that case. And so depending on what the exact outcome analysis is that you're interested in, there are different ways that you can account for that classification error in class assignments. If you use lane class membership to predict an outcome, the most common approach right now is what's called the BCH approach, okay? It's implemented in SAS, M plus, and Leighton Gold. If you have covariates, you can also do something similar. It uses BCH weights, but um, M plus calls it something different. And so uh, that question is, it's, um, it's definitely an advanced topic, but you have to be careful. The, the take home message for today is that you have to be careful assigning people to classes and using those assignments in follow-up analyses because your parameter estimates are, um, first of all, they're not estimated very well, they're biased. And second of all, even if they were not biased, even if you did okay, the standard errors are far too small. Um, and that's because you don't account for the fact that the posterior probabilities upon which those assignments are based were estimated. So there's tons of simulation work showing that the estimates are attenuated and that the standard errors are way too small. So you just have to be careful. All right. Yeah. Well, that is our workshop for today. Um, as we said earlier, these slides and uh, a video will be available on the Methodology Center website. Bethany, thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope you guys had fun. Thanks for having me.